give him praise if he has released you and he's provided. so often as the calendar rolls around we get to celebrate certain exciting holidays on the Lord's Day today Valentine's Day and for those husbands and boyfriends that you did not know or you forgot oh, <laughs> This is an opportunity, and this, is, and, and this is what's housed in it. And a lot of people think, well, you know, this whole idea of Valentine's Day was concocted by Hallmark to sell more cards. <laughs> and they got in cahoots with people like uh, Enstrom's. <laughs> And so basically, basically it's just, it's just a, a monetary type of thing where you, you know, then there's, and those, those of you that you might not have had a, the best of year, you might have been, things that might have been a little bit of a trial. And so then there's, there's Zales and Jared's because you got to make up some ground. Okay. 
But anyway, this is, and this is this insight that we have along the lines of Valentine's Day has been manipulated from its original intent. There was an individual called St. Valentine, and St. Valentine had, had nothing to do with what's going on today. Although, how many know that usually our Western holidays evolve and develop into things that it was never intended, and that's the way it is. So, however, the, the intent is good. I, I still enjoy the intent of letting the loved ones know that they are loved. <laughs> that's good. So if you got a loved one, and it doesn't have to be a spouse, but it's somebody that, it could be a good friend, it could be somebody that you're, you, you, you like them enough to sit next to them, turn to them and say, I love you. Okay. And, and if it was heartfelt, that's good. But if you're just doing it, the pastor told me I had to do this, so I love you. Love you. <laughs> that expression of love... And we end up with hearts and the chocolates and the flowers and, and those, those things. I, you know, I, I gave Roxy uh, a nice bouquet of roses and a, a nice card. And I did that before I, I left because I knew that I wouldn't, didn't think I was going to be here um, in time for her because she is celebrating our youngest granddaughter's second birthday today. She was, you know, went, went online and found a very, a very cheap plane ticket, extremely cheap, and she says, I'm out of here. I'm going to go spend time with my grandkids. So, and uh, she texted me this morning, you know, with the text early, early as she was getting ready and they're going to church there. And it's uh, an hour earlier than what we are dealing with. She texted me and, you know, the little emojis with a lot of hearts and, and stuff like that. And, and I love you. And that was, it was awesome. You know, you wake up to a, a text like that. It's all those things are well and good. And I understand, but you see, what happens is this, is that oftentimes those that find themselves in a place where they do not have type of relationship in the flesh, feel alienated and even more lonely, thinking that they're missing out on something that, and this oftentimes what these holidays do, is that those that do not have close relations or the connection with family, family is, is gone, either on to be with the Lord or live out of town, and they feel a disconnect. And so this morning, I want to connect every disconnect that this world has given to you and remind you again of the greatest love that is being extended to you. That provision of love, and that is love of the Father. The world has manipulated this idea of love. They sing about it all the time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And if they don't understand it, what's love got to do, got to do with it? <laughs> they write books about it. One of the best uh, New York bestsellers, The Love Languages. How many have read that book, that awesome book, Love the Five Love Languages? It is a good book. And I understand that we need to understand how to give and receive love. That's, that's all well and good. But I, I want you to know that as they are searching, the world outside the church is searching for love. And they're searching for love in all the wrong places. They sing about that. Looking for love in all the wrong... People make millions and billions of dollars off of singing about love, that they have no clue what it is. In fact, they'll let you think that if you go on a cruise, you can find love. The love boat. I remember that one. And then everything changes. You just get on the boat and then you can find love. Chances are the only thing you're going to find is seasick. Or if it was last year, you found COVID. Love. Love. 
And, and that understanding of the world's love, is, it's even found in the Greek language, is called eros, which is we, with the form of eros or erotica or those sensual attraction. I often talk to people when we're doing counseling and those that are going to be married and, and especially the younger, younger people, they, I, I ask them, okay, how do you know you love them? It was, it was love at first sight. Or we just fell in love. No, y'all fell in the mud, maybe, and you <laughs> you, you you fall into lust, but you don't fall into love. I mean, know that you don't fall into love. How many have been in a relationship before that it was primarily uh, an attraction in the flesh that did not last? It was primarily an, an ideal that this person has a lot in common with me. And, and so you begin this relationship which is not founded in the love that is eternal, the love that is everlasting. And so it is based on and must rely upon a love that is temporal. Well, as long as I'm feeling it, and feelings will betray you. Because one day you're feeling it, and the next day you're not. One day things are good. Because everybody's happy. But what happens when you go through a little bit of a test? You go through a little bit of a trial. Money gets tight. Or there's no money. Or... They, and, 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 and they don't do everything that, they, they forget something or they, they do something that, the, the, the little things that you thought was, oh, that's just a little quirk, quirk. And, and now a year or two years into this relationship, now it's very annoying because that is based on emotion of physical attraction. But God's love, that word, Agape, in the Greek, means unconditional, everlasting love. Not based upon works or agendas, flesh or appearance. God's love is founded in the purest type of love as he has loved you. Before you knew him, he loved you. He loved you when you didn't have the ability to love. He still loved you. And while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us to forgive us because of that love. That's God's love. Now that's his love in that purest form. We need that type of love. We want God's love to flow not only into us. We've received that love. How many with me this morning say, I need God's help to continue to give that love. To let it flow through me. To love one another as I have loved you. Was his commandment. To understand this love, we need to understand the, the avenue or the vehicle, if you would, of how his love is delivered. God delivered his love to us through this word called grace. Grace. Someone say grace. grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace... You have been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's, it's saved by grace, through faith, saved by grace. It's grace, God's grace that brought us to salvation. Nothing I have done, nothing I could do. I can't pay for it. I can't earn it. It is just given to me because of grace. That is awesome. So a couple of you, amen. 
You have received it because God loved you. And through his love, he said, I'm going to save you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to give you the provision of life because of his love. And that love is moved upon you through grace. That unmerited favor is it's said. And we're going to, we're going to look at grace a little bit different. Uh, uh, one quote, I love this quote, grace carried me here and by grace, I will carry on. That word in the Greek is charis. Say charis. Now, if you're going to be a good Greek speaker, you got to roll your tongue a little bit. Charis. And if you're not, if you're from Montana or Wyoming like him, you can say car grease. And it's close enough. Charis. That word there means, literally means, his goodwill, his loving kindness, and his favor. It is a spiritual condition that one is governed by in the power of divine grace. And so it is a spiritual condition that he is, uh, we are now governed by and moved upon by power of divine grace. That power of his provision. It is a, say, someone say it's a condition. It is a position. It is a place called grace. You see, it also, uh, that's one, one part of it. We're going to talk about the other side of grace, a benefit or the bounty. Now, in, in the Hebrew, it, um, that Hebrew word, karen, is, means favor, means acceptance, means provision. So in the Hebrew and the Greek, both of those ideals of grace give us some insight. Grace means that all of your mistakes, all of your mistakes now, serve a purpose instead of serving shame. That's the transition of grace. Before my mistakes, before my sin, before my faults and failures only brought shame. Now through grace, it's a provision of purpose. I now use what I have come out of. I'm now using what the enemy meant to destroy me, what I was bound by. Now I am being used of God in this purpose, in this place, in this position of grace. Now to move not only forward, but to be used as a blessing. Did y'all get that? And say, well, how can, how can God use something of my past, of the bondages and of the pain, of the sicknesses and the, bond, and, and, and the, overwhelming, the overwhelming darkness that the enemy used against me? You see, when the chains are broken, somebody got to help me preach this this morning. When the chains are broken... Now I can move in another fullness, in another avenue of grace. It's not just getting me there to freedom. Now grace is giving me a purpose on the other side of freedom. That grace of God. Again, it's a, it's a power of divine grace. You see, it's a benefit. God's given me a benefit, a bounty, a favor, acceptance, and a provision. This provision that is given to me now will govern me. Now will lead me into a, another condition. God's grace is more than forgiveness. God's grace is more than forgiveness. God's grace is his power at work. In and through us. How, how, how do we see this? And understand this, Zechariah 4, 7. And I didn't understand this for many, many years of what he's saying. Zechariah 4, 7. He said, Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Now, what mountain is Zerubbabel talking about? He's talking about a rubble, a pile of rubble. I don't know, that, that might be why they call him Zerubbabel, because he's dealing with rubble. What rubble are you talking about? I'm glad you asked. He was given the task to go back to Jerusalem to build the temple. Now that the walls were intact and they had safety, Zerubbabel was given the challenge to rebuild God's temple. But God's temple had been destroyed. All that was there was a, a pile of destruction. And he is looking at this pile and this mountain before him of disaster. And he's thinking, how can I ever rebuild? 
nothing in front of me. Have you ever been there that you've gone through certain circumstances and situations of your life that have left you in ruin? That has left you devastated? At least nod your head, yes. So I know that you're with me this morning. Some of you are. I know there's no football game on, so where are you at? <laughs> Have you ever been there where the enemy has just sought to destroy you, unwound everything, and you're sitting there in a pile of ashes like Job. What just happened? I don't know. Has your family ever been in a place of destruction? Has your life ever been there through relationships? Has your finances ever gone through a disaster? Has your purpose that you thought was lost is no longer in front of you? Has the gifts and the call of God seem to be fleeting and far away? Have you ever been faced with a pile of rubble? Say amen. And this is what he's looking at. How can anything be put back together? So who are you? Oh, great mountain. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. I want you to begin to understand this provision of grace that is before you. The very first step is salvation through grace, but grace is also a provision that is given to you so that you can fulfill your purpose. You have not walked in perfection. God does not command and require and demand that you are absolutely without fault or failures before you can begin to minister. If that was the case, none of us would be in ministry today. None of us would be able to walk in the grace of God if it required perfection for the very same purpose as grace came in. It said, it is not of works, lest anyone should boast. But you are saved by, through, you have faith. Faith is what begins to activate what's in you. But you can believe all you want. But God is only going to save you because of his desire of love. He loves you and has forgiven you. Not because he looked your way and said, Woo, this is a pretty good one. I think I'll forgive them. No, it is if you repent of your sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all righteousness. The only thing is up to me is to repent and say, God, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, come into my life. And then grace is released in a moment. So that's the first provision of grace. It is activated by faith. God gives to us his forgiveness. Now that grace, that provision that he has given to you also carries you into ministry. I want you to see this because there's a lot of people that like to set individuals up on pedestals. I hate being on a pedestal. Because when I'm on a pedestal, I always fall off. Like the coyote, you know, the, the roadrunner and coyote. And so. Preacher. <laughs> We're all saved the same way. We all have shortcomings. We all have faults and failures. But by his grace, come on, by his grace, we are overcoming. It's by his grace, not my strength. I don't have the ability to overcome anything. But by his grace, it's his grace that gives me the provision to overcome. Come on. It's his grace that gives me an anointing so I can walk in freedom, so I can walk in holiness, so I can walk in his goodness, so I can walk in his purpose. It's that grace. It is that unmerited favor. He gives me favor that I don't deserve. I don't understand it. I just begin to walk it. When everything else should be crumbling around, I'm just walking in the grace. Well, pastor, I don't really feel grace right now. I'm going to get to you in just a minute. Hang on. John Piper said this, Grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. 
Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. Jonathan Edwards said this, Grace is but glory begun, and glory is but grace perfected. By grace, the glory of God begins in our life. And the glory is but grace perfected when we walk in his glory. I like to look at it like this. His grace is like a river. Some say grace is kind of like a train. You get on the train, it's going one direction. How many know it's pretty tough to turn a train around? There's no U-turns in the track. It's very difficult. There is a roundhouse that they use to turn around the, the engines. But do you know those cars, when they get to the end, they go the opposite direction. They don't turn the whole thing around. You, it pulls in, and then it, it goes the opposite direction, but it's one way. How many know that? Just one. You get on the train, guess where you're going? Where those tracks are taking you. And that's pretty good, but there's a lot of spurs, and there's a lot of different directions on a train. So I like to say the river. I like to look at grace. This vehicle of grace is like the river. I want you to think about the Colorado River out here. Now, the Colorado River, it flows in the, in the bed, the river bed, that has been in that same place since it was created. Now, there might have been a couple of different channels that is taken over the year, but that the bed of that river that starts in the Rocky Mountain National Park, and it is, and we've been there uh, almost 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, we hiked to the headwaters, to the very beginnings of the Colorado River. Now, as it's going through town, it's a pretty good sized river, but where it begins is just an itty bitty trickle. It comes out of the mountain, comes out of a scree field, right out of the mountain. And it's, and, and, and the headwaters, and I took a big drink out of that Colorado River. And that pure, crystal, clear, clean water out of the very headwaters. Now I would not want to take a drink out of it here, but there, very good. Now, I can go back to that same place today and it's coming out of the same place in the mountain. And it's flowing down through the same valleys, through the same tributaries that come in. And it flows into the ocean, the same river. Now the river, this river called Grace, comes from the throne room of the Father. And it flows. If you get into that river, guess where you're going? where that river is taking you. You're at the mercy of the river. You're going to go where that river takes you. That river is powerful. It brings life. Everywhere, every, everywhere in this valley that that river touches, whether it's in the banks or whether it's through irrigation, brings life into this valley. Without it, we are a desert. Without it, ah, oh, this would not be a very lovely place to live. But because of the river, it's the same way it is with that river of grace. If you're in the river, not only are you going to receive that blessing, because you bring, it brings life to the dry and thirsty and the parched places of your being. When you get into the river of grace, it brings life. But that river also provides provision, a propulsion. It takes you to where God is leading you when you get into the river of grace. Come on. It'll lead you. It'll guide you. It'll provide for you. It'll take you. It'll propel you and put you in positions of purpose so you can begin to do what God called you to do. The river of grace, it flows from the throne. It brings, number one, forgiveness. Say forgiveness. It brings restoration. It brings healing. 
How many of you, how many of you have received those three things? First of all, forgiveness, restoration, and healing. And you're thankful for God's grace. Let's just give him thanks for those things. Come on. Thank you, Jesus, for that provision. Now that's, that's the first work of grace. Grace also brings protection, provision, direction, and purpose. I said it brings protection. God will protect those that are in this river of grace. If you're outside of grace, oh, you're fair game and the enemy will target you. But if you're in that provision, if you're in that river of grace, there's protection. How many know there's provision in the provision of grace? God has given you a provision, great provision, as you're in that river. How many know there's direction? God gives you specific direction. This is where he's leading you, where he's guiding you, and he gives you purpose. He gives you purpose. In 2 Corinthians, I want you to look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, chapter 12, verse 8. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. If you're turning there, I'll give you just a minute. This is one that you want to you wanna highlight, you want to underline, you want to put exclamation beside it. You might even want to write in the, in the margins how God has ministered to you along these insights. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Concerning the thing I pleaded with the Lord these three times that it would depart from me. How many of you have asked God to help you with something? And it seemed like the more you prayed, the worse it got. I want to give to you some, some insight of where you live. There's a lot of times that the preacher will preach about things that you say, well, wow, that would be really good if I could ever get there. I want to give you some insight of where you live, of things that are going on in your life. There are times that you will ask God to do something very specific. God, I need your help. We're dying down here. And you begin to connect and say, God, would you take this thing from me? Take it out of my life. It might be an individual that's giving you all kinds of grief. And you're saying, God, either save them or kill them. It might be a job that's giving you a hard time. Lord, that you would help me with this job. This job, give me another job. Give me another place. I don't like this job. This job is overwhelming. This job is not what I signed up for. Why am I here? It might be. It might be a, a place of ministry even. Lord, why am I doing this? You know, the Israelites... They were crying out considerably about their position in Egypt. Now they had gone to Egypt because they were starving. And Egypt was their provision. Egypt was their rescue. Through, I mean, I remember there was a young man that received visions about what God was going to do. His daddy gave him a coat of many colors. He ends up in Egypt because his brother sold him into slavery and in jail he was exalted. God led him into the place where he was now provisioned and he, he was able to rescue his family. In fact, Israel was rescued because uh, through God's help in this position. Now, that's a, that's a great powerful message in and of itself. But here, 300 years uh, are, are go by and now the same place that was a blessing now becomes a curse. And they're in slavery. They're suffering. And they begin to complain a little bit. Well, they complain a lot. God, you got to rescue us. And so he sends a rescuer, and guess, he takes them from Egypt to the wilderness. And they're having a hard time now in the wilderness. And now... They go from complaining about making bricks to complaining about, we don't have any food. 
And they, 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 they make this statement. They, they make this, they make their case with Moses saying, Moshe, why did you take us out of Egypt? Where we had pots of meat every night around the campfire. Life was so good. We had leeks and garlic and onions. It was great. They forgot about the slavery part, about being whipped, about having to do the, the I mean, remember, we're like this, we're like this. We oftentimes remember the best of the situation, which we ask God to remove us from. It was painful, it was a problem, and we're saying, God, you gotta help us. And so he helps you, and he begins in the process, say process, See, the process of deliverance required the wilderness. Because it's one thing to get you out of Egypt, and it's another thing to get Egypt out of you. And you have to go through a time of deliverance for that to really work so you can appreciate the blessing. You can appreciate what God has for you. To build in you a purpose requires us to go through a little bit of trial and tribulation to understand what it is that God wants to do. And so if he were to take them immediately from, from Egypt into Zion, the problem with Zion is that they needed to worship one God. And what they had done is they brought out of Egypt many gods, and they were worshiping the Egyptian gods. How many, how many remember that? It didn't take them long. Moses went up under the mountain. He was gone for a month. And he's gone for a month, and he's receiving what? He's receiving the law. He's receiving direction. He's receiving purpose. He's receiving the provision for the entire, entire nation. And when he comes down, they were gone for just a little bit, gone, gone for a month. And what happened is that they had gone back to worshiping the gods of Egypt. Even the one that God had given to him to make sure the law was maintained, the precepts and the ways of God. Aaron, and he asked Aaron about that. He said, they're worshiping this golden calf. And they're dancing around and they're, they're entering into the party and they're entering into the mentality that they had in Egypt. And they're, they're worshiping, they're worshiping this, this calf, this golden calf. And Moses, I love this, I love this little, little insight. And Moses asked Aaron, what are you doing? What's the fool with you, boy? What you doing? And you know what Aaron says? I don't know. We were just tossing stuff into the fire, and out it came. <laughs> That's what the wilderness was all about. It's preparation to receive the blessing. Paul was asking God to remove something that God allowed to be there for a reason, for a purpose. He asked, he said, I asked three times that this thing would depart from me. And you know what the answer was? My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is Jesus' strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, therefore, I would rather gladly boast in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So therefore, I will take pleasure in infirmity and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. My grace is sufficient for you. If all you know about grace is just forgiveness, then you will not understand what Jesus was telling Paul. He's not telling him that my forgiveness is, is good enough. 
Grace means so much more than just being forgiven. Grace is all about a provision of not only blessing, but anointing and strength for purpose. God ministers to you and then through you through the river of this thing called grace. His grace is good enough. In fact, his grace is more than enough. So what I've found, and when I'm going through it, come on, when I'm going through it, I didn't say when I'm stuck in it. <laughs> when I'm going through it, because I'm going to go through. I'm not going to rest. I'm not going to camp in the middle of the valley. I'm going to go through it. I'm not going to just say, well, Lord, I'm going to wander around here for a while. No, I'm going through. Someone else tonight, come on, help me out. I'm going through. Say, I'm going through it. I'm going through it. On the purpose of going through it, God gives me the strength. And as I'm going through, as I'm going through, as I'm going through, God not only meets me in the middle, but oftentimes he's the one that's carrying me. And I'm not seeing it. All I'm seeing is the flame. All I'm seeing is the problem. All I'm seeing is the hurt. All I'm seeing is the destitution. All I'm seeing is the overwhelming odds. That's all I'm focused on. And I got to get my mind straight. I got to get my eyes focused on what the Lord is causing me to focus on now. This grace that is carrying me through it. And there's a purpose behind it. So in the midst of all that that's going on, I need to listen to the Holy Spirit that say, I'm giving you the preparation. I'm giving you the provision. And it only can come to you in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the persecution. So that thing that you've been asking God to remove, that thing that you've been asking God to just radically take out of your life, and when he returns, I like it when the enemy hits you and the enemy pounds on you and you call out Jesus I need some help and help comes immediately just like that boom immediately help comes power comes authority comes you shake off that snake into the fire and you drive on how many like that instantaneously revival instantaneously power and authority when the enemy shows up in Jesus name get under my feet and then you dance on him for a while okay I like that that's authority of the authority of the power of the, of, the, of, the, of the believer, of the child of the living God. Now, there are times that he says, no. We don't like no. Know what I mean? <laughs> we like yes. Yes. But then he says no. Normally on the other side of no, we go, why? <laughs> Instead of, Lord, what do you want to do? Lord, what do I need to receive in this season? What do I need to know? What do I need to learn? What do I need to do? You see, we've been trying to accomplish these things on our own. And oftentimes, when you are in that place where you are flowing in the authority and, you, and you're conquering and you're winning battle after battle after battle, and it seems like you are just steamrolling along, and then all of a sudden, there's a roadblock. All of a sudden, there's a pitfall. All of a sudden, there is a moment when everything falls apart, and you're wondering, Lord, what happened to my faith? What happened to the authority? What happened to the presence of the Holy Spirit? And, and the answer is nothing happened. Now you are walking into a whole new arena of provision that God is going to use to make sure that we remember that he's God and we're not. That he is the provider and that we need him on a consistent basis. So that trial, that situation, 
is still in the river of grace. It's still in that flow of grace. Yes, there are times that he answers immediately and you receive the answer and you receive that provision in instantaneous healing. But then there's some times that it's progressive and he's working some things out. You don't know what tomorrow holds. All you know is who holds tomorrow. Therefore, you trust him in what you're dealing with right now. Thank him for the immediate victories and thank him for the victories that take place over time. It still is powerful. It is still is just as anointed. There is, there is those great progressions that are taking place in your life right now. It is all about what God needs to do in me. So I will release that provision of grace. I'll take pleasure in the infirmity and the reproaches and the needs and the persecutions and the distresses for Christ's sake. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. In all this, we need more grace. We need more grace. We need greater grace. How many have done well with the persecutions, tribulations, with the trials? How many can say, well, you know, I've, I had some pretty good reproaches, some needs, some infirmities, some things that hit me. Man, it didn't even phase me. I didn't even skip a beat. Anybody here like that? So we're kind of all there, aren't we? We call it all, all walk in the same road of the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs. That's why this message is given to you, is released to you, because though you think that you have been removed somehow, some way, that, that the Lord has just misplaced your provision somewhere and, and you don't have what you need, all the while it's, you have everything that you need because he's calling you. He's beckoning you. He's wooing you. He's bringing you to a place of greater grace. And he's using the storm. And he's using this trial. What do you need in the midst? You need greater grace. Greater grace. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Look at that. He gives more grace. Do you need more grace? And you are blessed because if you need more grace, he's going to give more grace. <laughs> Therefore, he said, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. That's how you get more grace. To allow him to do what he needs to do to remind me that I need him and that he's doing a, a much more, exceedingly abundantly more than I can think or ask. God is doing something so profound that I cannot understand on this side, but I do know that he's up to something. And he's up to something pretty awesome. He's up to something pretty powerful. How do I know that? Because this is happening across the board, not just a few people in this assembly, but across the nations, not just the United States, nations that God is quickening his church, that he's preparing his church. He's causing them to rely upon him more and more. Because we need to carry that anointing. We need to carry a greater provision. Because the purpose that he's giving to us is something we have not yet seen. 
we have not yet understood. So in this preparatory work, God give you greater grace. God give you more grace. That's your heart. That's your desire. Would you stand with me? We can say to this mountain that's in front of you, grace, grace. God's going to take this pile of rubble, make that a place for you to begin again, a place for you not only to rebound, but to be restored, to be blessed, to walk in that greater grace. How many, how many need more grace in your, in your family? How many need more grace in your, in, at work, your place of work? How many need more grace in your neighborhood? That neighbor that it seems like no matter what you do, they're just still going to be ugly. How many need more grace in, the, in your ministries that God would give you a greater anointing, a, a greater grace, a greater grace? And as we pray, we're going to ask the Lord to do that and ask the Lord to increase. He said if we would humble ourselves and just in the very f fact that we recognize we need more and the only way that we're going to get more is understanding it's only through him. As Jesus spoke to Paul, he's speaking to you again. His grace is sufficient for you. Father in heaven, I thank you. For your word, and I thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and you've spoken to us. I thank you, Lord, that you are a God that gives more grace. Exceeding grace. Grace that is sufficient. Grace that will carry us. Grace that is enough. No matter what we're faced with, no matter what we're going through, I know, Lord, that you are working right now. There might be one here today that is a little bit despondent, a little bit discouraged. They're overwhelmed because they're faced with circumstances and situations. That they don't know, Lord, if you're there. They don't know if they're going to make it through. But, Lord, we say to this mountain in front of us, grace, grace. And release that grace and release that provision as we get into that river one more time. Let us receive that provision. Let us receive the help, the healing, the restoration, your grace, your grace. Lord, to one that's here that might be on the outside of your grace, Lord, they're having a hard time. I ask, Lord, that as they surrender to you, that first work of grace will wash over them, bring forgiveness, bring restoration, bring the greatest healing, the healing of our soul, of our spirit. And then bring that connection one more time to those that are kind of wandering and they don't know, Lord, why are we wandering? I'm asking, Lord, that you'd reveal your purpose of wilderness and your purpose of that mountain. Lord, do the work that only you can do and bring the help that only you can bring as you strengthen and you provide one more time. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want you to, if you would, there's just in your mind's eye that situation, that circumstance that you need more grace. It might be like that mountain that Zerubbabel was dealing with. It might be, it might be a situation, circumstance that you're, you're, having, you're overwhelmed with. It might be relational, financial whatever it is. I'm just in your mind's eye. I want you to grab a hold of that. And with, out loud, I want you to say, grace, grace. Speak to that mountain right now. Say, grace, grace. Again, one more time, out loud. Grace, grace. In Jesus' name, I speak grace, grace to this mountain. This mountain be made level. So the provision be made whole in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's give him praise. Let's give him praise. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Prayer staff. Prayer staff.